Hey everyone, and welcome to Made of Stardust. I'm your host, Jolie Goodnight, and this is a podcast about people who aspire to inspire. Each one of our guests has something special about them, a spirited spark to them that breathes life into the people they inspire. After all, that's what the word inspire originally meant, to breathe life into. This podcast is supported by listener support, so go to joliegoodnight.com slash podcast to help keep Made of Stardust shooting for the stars. Get access to exclusive content every month and all the fun goodies. In the name of all that is Hollywood, I am so excited about today's guest, Brian Karpus. They are a self-described, time-traveling model and starlet, and millennial old movie nerd who loves to look at classic cinema through the lens of a modern eye. Why I want you to know and totally fall in love with Brian is because of their Technicolor site on Instagram as Them Fatale and sound on the podcast Vintage Millennial. The moment you tune into this episode, I want you to open your phone and feast your eyes on the dreamy, gorgeous, vintage re-envisionings they create. My jaw dropped when I discovered them because everything they do has the quintessential mix of drama and comedy, retro and now, while taking you into a world you didn't even know you were missing yet. And their take on how to live the fantasy that lives in your head? You're not even ready for this. Yay! (laughs) Hi, Brian! Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I can't complain. Oh, that's good. That's good. I love your spot. I love where you're at. All your posters behind you. You got Patsy back there. Thank you. Yeah, I got it's like an original ad or poster. I don't know. It's something original with like an ad for her. And I love Patsy. Mm -hmm. I have Judy Holiday. I have um, Betty. And then this is a funny girl poster. You can't really see all of it. And then I got another Judy Holiday. I got a Josephine Baker, a little ceramic dog. That's the Nina Simone. Oh, so, you got everybody. Yeah. I want like a very like, I want a, a gallery wall that says, this is a lot, but cohesive. <laughs> That's clearly how I want a bedroom to be. <laughs> Honestly, to me, that is like, I mean, as minimal as you can get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm a maximalist. I like tried to pare it down in yes. here a little bit. For anyone who's listening and not seeing, um, both of us are in giant mansions. <laughs> Palaces. <laughs> Palaces. Um, <laughs> that are filled with the perfect amount of stuff. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> Well, I'm so excited that you're joining me for Made of Stardust. Mm. Um, I am going to just totally admit for a sec that uh, when I first found you on Instagram, I was relieved. (laughs) Because... I don't know if that's like an emotion you feel often. (laughs) That's that's typically the emotion that I don't evoke in people. <laughs> Usually it's quite the opposite. Usually people are like, oh my God, what the fuck is this? Well, With I those usual screams. Oh my God, I love this. I I had this like crazy thing in my head where mm-hmm. I was going to um, recreate album covers from the 50s and 60s because, mm-hmm. you know, I'm a jazz singer or whatever. And I was like, right. ooh, I'm totally going to do that. And I did one. And it was really bad. And I totally failed. Like, my graphic design minor did not prepare me (laughs) for it in any way. (laughs) And um, I felt really proud of it at the moment, though. And I posted it and was like, everyone's gonna love this. And then, like, I think it got maybe two or three likes. (laughs) Like in in my whatever seven thousand follower world, and I was like, oh, that's. And then so I took crushed. another look, and I was yeah. like, yeah, this is really bad, actually. And then I found you, on, and I was like, oh, thank God, this void is filled. I don't have to try to do this anymore because <laughs> you do it so beautifully and so perfectly, and I'm super excited because I'm already busy enough. I don't want to have to try to do it, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> So I'm just so excited that you're doing it and you're doing it well. Um, but for that folks me- that haven't had the pleasure of finding you yet, 
can you please kind of explain your world for a sec? Oh, God. Uh, um, first of all, thank you for that. Uh, that really means a lot because I think you are an absolute D-O-L-L. And Aww. I, yes, I really do. Um, I was talking to, um, do you follow Cassandra Selden? Mm, I don't think, I don't know. She's another know. vintage doll on Instagram. And I okay. recently met up with her because I recently moved to New York. And we were talking about just like the summer of 2020, for some reason, for all of us on, like who are vintage Instagram, uh, as we I like to say dolls, um, we all seem to have found each other in that like time period, like that summer of 2020. And mm-hmm. it's been like a really beautiful, like tight community of like, I feel like it's like, I would say in the, like, you and I would probably just list the same people. Like it just yeah. reposts and like, yeah. like share us and like comment mm-hmm. and support. Like it's mm-hmm. been a very nice thing. So like, that's when I like, you know, I believe when I discovered you two, when whoever follow each other first. Um, so yeah, it's just great. Um, my Instagram world, uh, back to your question. Um, that's a question in <laughs> French for all those who don't know. Um, I, so my Instagram, okay. So my Instagram presence has been like a journey, I would say. So, and I've gone to a place where it's like exactly what I like, like what I want. Um, you know, before I, so, um, I was like a very much just like, I was much heavier than I was, um, still stunning, um, but like much heavier and I couldn't fit into a lot of the clothes I could wear. So, but I was always dressed, mm-hmm. always dressed up. So I was like, and I wasn't as um, in tune with my non binaryness yet. So mm-hmm. mine was very about like plus size gay male presenting like fashion with like a feminine twist. Cause like uh, we've never, we've never even tried to act masculine. The most masculine I've ever, the most masculine I've ever been was like when I'm like, look at me, I'm wearing all black. I'm Johnny Cash. Like that's, <laughs> yeah, that's mass. Um, I wear black and I'm like, I walk the line, honey. Um, (laughs) And then I had gastric surgery um, and lost a lot of the weight. And when I lost all the weight, for me, I really started discovering myself, my gender identity. And through that, I was able to realize I could not only fit into a lot more of the clothes that I always wanted to, but I could, um, what was I going to say? I could... um, experiment more I could see what I like and I started experimenting with how I can show off my waist how I can do this and that so my Mm -hmm. it went from being like that like just strictly plus size fashion to plus size fashion with a much more queer edge and then it just kind of snowballed into being like very much like what you see now Mm -hmm. and then um during quarantine I was realizing like after a while, so this was the thing, my, once quarantine started, I realized, sorry, I'm rambling. I realized. Oh no, ramble away. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. I love it. Um, I, um, after, cause this was the thing I decided I was going to do an Instagram post a day. Cause that way I was going to get up. I was going to get showered. I was going to get shaved. I was going to get dressed. I was going to put on a lip. I was going to mm-hmm. um, tighten my waist. So I had a blue line around my like mid stomach, like, I was going to become a doll for at least an hour of my day. And I was going to celebrate that by posting on Instagram. Now, one thing I realized, I didn't realize until like a couple months later that I was getting broke. Like I was like broke, like midway through every month because I was just buying and buying clothes. And then I realized I'm like, one, where am I going? Two, I can't like, I, I'm not like, I'm not married. I'm not married to an old man with oil tycoon money many many debilitating illnesses and all estrangement from children yet so i can't spend like the way i honestly i was just watching a documentary today about anna nicole and she really is like the martyr you know what i mean i do know what you mean (laughs) i always say i always say i wish she had a friend like me because i would have been the one before she got married to be like bitch get your name in paper Mm -hmm. don't put a tape recorder between your titties Mm-mm. Get your name in paper. Mm-hmm. Everything would have been mm-hmm. fine. I'm just, sorry. I go on such a rant about our Texas queen. Um, oh, it's completely understandable. Yeah. The first time I saw a picture of her, I was like, oh, my body is cool. <laughs> I was, know? I, 
one day as I went on to do, um, got high and was sitting on my couch listening to music and just pondering the wonders and mysteries of life. And it dawned on me, she is the first plus size supermodel. Mm, there was not a plus size yeah. model in her time. And by plus size, I mean like fashion standards plus size. Sure. sure. Um, she was, you know, playmate of the year. She was the face of Gas. She's honestly, arguably the most iconic face of Gas ever. She had a huge H&M campaign in Europe. She then mm-hmm. went on, you know, to do Lane Bryant and like a whole bunch. Like she really, I'm just saying. Anna Nicole, Anna Nicole was Anna Nicole so Ashley Graham could be on Vogue. <laughs> that's, ex- that's, that's right. You're so right. <laughs> that's yeah. 100%. Oh. Um, oh, I remember. Oh, I remember. So... <laughs> Um, I realized I needed to figure out a way to, um, keep doing these Instagrams a day because it was good for me, like mental health wise, just to be active. I always Mm -hmm. called it, it's like my knitting, like it's just my escape for a couple hours of like putting on something and doing something. And then I was talking to, um, fellow Instagram doll, Jerry Mae James. Yeah. Um, So do you, so sweet. Yeah, like, she she's so beautiful. I don't know her yet, but we, at this point, I would call her like a good friend. We've talked like a lot ever since quarantine started, and I've gone to meet her um, in person. But when I was in LA, LA, and she's literally the like most relaxed, but like she just radiates such a calm, beautiful soul that at me, who's like a manic but like a manic um needs to make everyone laugh a minute kind of soul it balances like yeah sometimes one man's manic is another man's fun thank you <laughs> just saying <laughs> oh no no i am i've been that for many men <laughs> let me tell you <laughs> there we go all my Bing. life for centuries um but we digress um I um, was talking to her and I was, I've always loved how she edits her photos. She always Mm -hmm. has this like very dreamy like edit. And I asked her what she uses to edit. And she told me this app called PixArt um, would like to be sponsored. Not yet, but one day maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, And she, uh, I just was playing along with it. And I realized how I could like edit these photos, myself into these photos. And I just kept playing with it. And I, realized it looked good enough to post and that's just how it what it is now is pretty much taking out some skinny bitch (laughs) taking out like dovima's gorgeous ass and putting in my gorgeous ass to replace Uh her and you know make myself the model and it for me it's like i am now fully living the fantasy that i live in my head and now the world can visually see my fantasy which is I call myself a time traveling model and movie starlet. I always mm-hmm. say it with a giggle because I'm like, that's a lot, but it, I, that's how I see myself. Um, and I get to show that through my Instagram. And I get to show what eras speak to me the most. I get to show what kind of um, photography speaks to me. I get to, you know, share a little bit of my love for like, I genuinely do like obsess over models. Like, I have like a Naomi Campbell photo that I'm dying to recreate. And like that mm. for me is exciting because like one, I know the, fo- I know the photo will look good, but I like, <laughs> I just want like, she's one of my, like when I'm walking down the streets of New York, I think I'm Naomi Campbell. Like, I think I'm <sighs> that powerful and that like, I, like I try to carry that energy with me when I walk everywhere. So like, it's exciting for me to like recreate these photos. And like, I don't think these people are ever going to see them in a billion years, but like, it's like but my they might. They might, might, but like small chance. But at the end of the day, it's like I get to recreate like my heroes. I get to like pre- kind of I don't know. It's just fun. It's just listen. Yeah. I have a question. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but no, I've been uh, talking a lot. This is not even. <laughs> this is like not even on my dorky little question list for you because you know the podcast is made of stardust with the idea that we're all made of stardust right yeah and every object every everything everything is made of stardust so i have this theory that um when you see someone or something that you're like oh you are so my people or this has to come home with me or that is my pet or that you know whatever it is my theory is that 
you are made of the same stars dust. <laughs> oh, I love that. I don't, you know, I don't know. No, uh, who knows? I, who knows? But like, why not? No, and, I'm like, I, oh, sorry. Well, so what I wondered when you said Naomi Campbell and that that's like how you feel when you walk down the street and you feel so connected to her. I wonder if maybe y'all share some of the same stars, stardust. Maybe. I don't know. I, I'm a big past lives believer, believer. Mm -hmm. I believe that we have all lived many, 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 many lives. And I think that that's how, why there's certain people you meet and automatically you are, you eat a good or bad. You're like, you are mm -hmm. like, you know, one. And I, um, excuse me. I think that, uh, that's like the same kind of energy, what you're saying. Like yeah. there, we all are, have these kind of stardusts connected certain stardusts connect to one for whatever reason. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so when you were talking about your, were you know, these are the, your, how you envision yourself and the visions that you have of, um, you know, everything that you want. Are these the same visions that you had when you were a kid? Like, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, I wanted to be Marilyn Monroe. Like, ah, hands yeah. down boots. If you asked me when I was like that <laughs> as a child, I probably would say, I wouldn't say Marilyn Monroe, but in my head, I'd be like, Marilyn. Like, I want to be, I remember seeing, I, I remember the first time I ever watched uh, Joan for Blondes. I was like six. And that was the very first time I ever watched her, ever saw her. And I mean, look, I love Jane Russell, but you know, it, there's yeah. something just about her when you're looking, like you're like when she's on screen, you just can't help but look at her mm -hmm. and whatever that, emotion evokes you just can't help that and for me looking at her at that age I just was like this is all I want to be mm -hmm. I want to be funny I want to be glamorous I want to be beautiful I want to um have men fall at their feet for me like I want like yeah I just wanted to be that and I didn't really understand it though because I didn't want to be a woman like that was always something that like it was like a mm -hmm. battle growing up being like okay, I don't want to be a woman, but I don't like this whole man thing. This honest, yeah. That honestly sounds stupid, um, mm -hmm. if I may be <laughs> frank. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was always a constant. You know, that's so funny that we've, like, already arrived at Marilyn and at Anna Nicole, both of these, like, Blonde. vibrant, yeah. bombshell, mm -hmm. light they're both like whether or not even like blonde or not i mean i think the blonde yeah. helps for sure but i think it's more that these women like had this way of lighting up a room that they walked mm -hmm. into and it was hard to take your eyes off of and yeah. so what like if that was your vision as as a kid of marilyn what are all the things that you ended up doing? Like I know about your Instagram, but like what are the other parts of your life that you ended up kind of translating that into? Um, I would say performing is probably a big thing. Um, I haven't done it since quarantine, but like stand up was a really big thing. Um, for me, I have a theater background um, I think that's really, really where it translated to. And I would love to, I had, um, uh, like my friends make fun of me now because I would like, if you bring this moment in my life up, I will immediately just get triggered. And it's like, it's, it's amusing because it's, a it's about theater. Like it's like not getting a part. I didn't, um, mm. so the story is my sophomore year of college, um, the, Fall musical was Hairspray. And I auditioned and got down to me and two other guys for the part of Edna. And this is like my dream role. This is the part I was like, I am born to play this. I've been t told, pe I remind people of Harvey Fire scenes since I was like a teenager. Uh -huh. Like I knew I got the, and when I left the audition, I was like, crown me. <laughs> like put yeah. the crown on my head. Now, 
And it was a great feeling too, because I was the only, like at that point, the only non-musical major who didn't like get that far, at least for that part. And I felt very out of place, but it, so it felt even more good. It felt like, like I was the jinx monsoon of this, Mm -hmm. like, of Mm -hmm. like, I was the out of, like, it was that feeling. So they say that the cast list is not going to come out till Monday. That was on a Friday. Next day, Saturday. It's Yom Kippur. I don't fast. Today I'm fasting. I'm giving my, I am saying sorry for all my sins so I could get a part. And I was honest with the Lord. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) But I was like, I'm not going to eat for you today because I want this part. So the day end, and he, and she, he, they, whatever, if there's a God, whatever, someone in the universe looked at that, smiled and laughed and said, okay. (laughs) Okay. So I didn't eat the whole day. Sundown comes. I go to get food. I check my email. The cast list gives up. My name is not next to that. Uh. Um, And it really screwed with my head. And I found out later on from a friend that was working on the show that they were going to use a fat suit on the guy that they did cast, which uh, uh, I was already like that hurt. Like that made, it just like that broke me for, I will not lie for a long time. And it's weird because nothing like really breaks me like that. Like I'm usually, especially auditioning and performing. I'm always like, everyone has their p- opinion. My day mm-hmm. will come. I've always had that attitude. That really stopped me from, like, auditioning for a really long time. And I would do things here and there, but it just never felt good. Um, And I think also that kind of, I think the reason why is because it's the only part I felt that would celebrate who I, like, my specific talents as in my gender roles. Mm -hmm. You know, and now I think we're living in a world where not gender nonconforming casting is becoming more of a thing. People are having more open minds to doing parts that are traditionally female, traditionally masculine, and uh, gender reversing them. So I, I'm getting like that feeling of like doing that again. I'm sorry, I forgot your original question. I just remember it, that one. Yeah, I don't like, know, and it so doesn't matter because that is such a. I talk a lot. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I love it. That's that's like. Uh... It's um it's kind of a dream come true to have a guest on who is good at talking. Um and especially cuz what you have to say is really interesting and it's funny how much like one not getting one part can change so much in our lives. Like it can yeah. really really send us in a totally different yeah. trajectory. It can send us in a totally different direction. It can like break parts of us that we thought were mm. completely um like unshatterable <laughs> that's yes. a word and then it can also create these like magnificent parts of us that we didn't know were supposed to even arrive and, and yeah. come be a part of us you know like I was in theater too and I had a, a somewhat similar experience in that um, I mean not similar but a, a one that sent me in a weird direction in that I would audition for roles and I was just never going to get the ingenue was just never going to happen. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't really see myself for myself, I guess. And so I kept either not getting the role because there were no other female parts, like either ingenue or bust at that point. And everyone else in the play is, is a male or like maybe right. there's like a walk on line for five seconds that has um, a woman in that role. But, um, you know, there just aren't that many parts. So yeah, um, I would either not get a role or the role I would get would be um hypersexualized or it would be a villain and i was just like i'm not going to be able to make a career out of these roles because yeah. there aren't that many of them and then uh-huh. i was cast in shakespeare i was i was cast as don john i was like don don juanita is what they ended up calling me that's oh, traditionally okay. a man that plays that role and then, of course, they, I was like cast, I was like a dominatrix version, and it was awesome, and it was super empowering. But at the time, I was like really bitter about it, because mm-hmm. I was like, I just don't understand what, yeah. how am I going to possibly make any kind of living doing this? And how am I going to achieve my dream if I can never be the leading lady? But that's what led me to burlesque. Because yeah. I was like, ooh, I can be a leading lady and I can play whatever character I want to. I can be the ingenue if I want to. 
frankly, it never comes off that way. Like, <laughs> I think the director saw something I couldn't. I think I just am not really going to be the ingenue, but I can be the leading lady. And if I'm going to be the villain, it can be in whatever way I want to. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. No, totally. I feel the same way about, I mean, I haven't, I, I still am like teeter tottering if I really do want to get back into stand up. I've been writing, but I haven't had like the real drive to go out and do it. Mm -hmm. um, but that was honestly the hairspray, my hairspray experience was what ended up getting me just made, go to my first few open mics and start realizing like, oh wait, I'm center stage. <laughs> Every now and then I stop myself, I'm like, you are an Aries. Um, and, um, but yeah, I get to be center stage. I am Diana Ross, there's no other Supremes. Mm -hmm. I get to control the narrative. I can control what I wear, how I, what I say, what I feel. It's all me, it's all, I'm in control completely. And it's that, like you just said, like, even like, even when you bomb, like I had one of those, like, have you ever seen, um, Obvious Child with Jenny Slate? Yes. Remember yeah. the scene when she's like, she's drunk stand up after her breakup? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I went through something like that once. And like, oh. you go, you're in, you're in, you're in that moment. You're drunk. You are literally yelling at one person because you saw them like just like the just like check their phone for two seconds, but you're going through your own thing, mm -hmm. and you're in the middle of it. And you realize this is happening, <laughs> and I just <laughs> you now are like I'm that character. I'm that character for that evening. Yeah. And we can't if we stop now, it's going to be even worse. So just uh. keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so you, like, kind of, I want to connect the dots for a sec. So you went to school for theater, and then mm -hmm. you started doing stand-up? Well, or, like, how did everything lead, like, what's the pathway? How did everything so lead to the I other went to, thing to the other thing? So I went to Columbia College, Chicago. I'm originally from, I, as I like to say, I am born fed, but not inbred in Houston, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Wholesome. And um, I went to Columbia College in Chicago for originally for theater, for like straight acting. And then my freshman year, when I got there, they announced and at some like at like mid semester, whenever they announced um, that they are going that Second City and um, which if you don't know what Second City is, Second City is a very famous comedy theater and conservatory based type school it has produced majority of the snl cast people like joan rivers has come out of there Halle berry has come out of there. like major 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 people come out of second city um it's it's kind of a waste of money if i'm being honest but <laughs> a lot of famous people come out of there um and still do honestly because second seconds so i don't know if you know this but snl has um like auditions every like two years or every no every year and they go to the same theaters they go to second city i think they go to um in chicago i think they go to upright uh, in new york and then i think they go to um what's the one in la the one that like elvira came from um whatever that theater is they go there like they always do that year so mm -hmm. fun fact mm -hmm. um so they announced that they were my school and them were announced that they're coming together to make a comedy studies major. And after my first, like when I came into, um, and I had no right to think this highly of myself based on like my high school acting, like theater time. However, I walked in there being like, I'm Richard Burden, bow down. And yeah. I get, but when I get there, all my acting teachers, they're giving me like roles that don't really fit or whatever. But then, uh, when I really shine in my acting classes is when they're like, we want you to improv a character. You got to come. This is the story. This is the plot. This is what you're here. Your character's here for come as that character. And I, of course, here's, I'm the very much the kind of person that if you do not give me the assignment full out in front, mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it probably, especially as a freshman in college. And most of all of them, I came still drunk from the night before and not prepared. <laughs> and then they would call me and I would just like think of something like right before the person would um, 
before me would go, which was always my luck because someone would always went before me and I would just make up something on the spot and it would always do well, always. And my teachers were always, uh, always asked, what was your process? And I was honest. I said, to be honest, I forgot. So I just did this now. And my final evaluations of like freshman year were basically like, you should do stand up. You should do comedy. You should try this. And so when they announced the major, I was like, okay, I'm going to switch over to this. I can always switch back to acting if I don't want to. It's still in the same uh, major technically. So, you know, I'm still going to be taking the same classes essentially, just with some different, a little difference. So I took like a few of my first classes and I was like, oh, I like this. And then uh, part of the, of the major is you spend a full semester at Second City. Like you do like an accelerated version of their conservatory program. And there I learned, I really got, it was able to get into like the writing aspect and, mm. um, and um, the performance aspect of like of straight comedy, not like comedic acting plays type acting mm-hmm. um and i realized like second city the institution of it is not for me but i did take away a lot of different things that i think i use in my like instagram even like uh-huh. like the short little like how to just write something short and quick like as like a caption that's like funny but gets the point yeah. or like you know just little things like that and also taught me how much i love Stand up, and I love solo performance too. So yeah, that's where all that connects. You're so lucky that you had some professors that were like paying attention, <laughs> yeah, and, and giving a shit to put it in that way. For that they were like, instead of being like, if you only applied yourself and whatever. Oh yeah, that they were like, oh, actually, let's just go with with who they are, and and suggest this route instead like that's that's yeah. awesome because you know I'll, I think a lot of students get into theater that way where it's like maybe you were the best in your high school or the mm-hmm. best in your community theater and then you get to college and you like become a little bit of a different person and you're not necessarily actually right for what you thought you were and then also drinking <laughs> and partying yes. and downtown and whatever life yeah. kind of kicks in mm-hmm. and also it's really hard to apply yourself to something that maybe you love and maybe is your passion but maybe you're not supposed to do that thing at least not right now yes for sure you know like maybe down the road you're just meant for the role of a lifetime but in that moment oh, yeah. you probably would be applying yourself to it differently if that's if that's something that you really really want um but so texas mm. i have to i have to ask and it's so funny what did you say like inbred what <laughs> born born fed but not inbred <laughs> Which is so funny because for folks who have never been to Houston, it has some of the like most incredible fine arts. Some of my favorite museums mm-hmm. are in Houston. Like, oh, Houston, but I, yeah. I guess because we're situated in in Texas. Um, oh, my mic is falling a little bit here. Uh, we definitely have to have these like other disclaimers about um, <laughs> yeah. who we are. How much time did you spend in Texas? Oh, my whole childhood. I uh, skated. I was, uh, Houston was home till I was 19. Oh, okay. So you mm-hmm. are, ah, oh, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you moved whenever you went to college. Yes. So Houston's a really, really big place too. The part of Houston that you grew up in, were there other folks that were interested in the same stuff as you? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming here that you've always loved loved vintage things vintage movies and culture in some sort of way even if it was like in a small way yes i always have always 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 was very just like googling you know 50s you know and just seeing whatever comes up you know things like that um yeah i always have and i i had a lot of friends growing up that was not like a problem i was not a lonely person Um, but in that regard, I was very lonely. I had no one that was interested in the vintage old movies. No one Mm -hmm. seemed, I would try be like, towards high school, my friends were mostly all theater, other theater kids. And fun for us was just chilling at 
someone's house and he, if we weren't like watching and making fun of like a past show that we all did like on the like the deep like the home <laughs> dvd which is so nerdy now saying that out loud um that's, i love it i love oh i love it too um because it's don't tell me if you if you weren't a theater kid and acted like you never like watched like the performances that were um, recorded you're lying you are beyond lying <laughs> Um, I don't know a single one that doesn't have their DVDs somewhere in their home. Uh, yeah, we definitely watched our UIL performance and we're still <laughs> just furious that we yes. didn't win that whatever particular year that we couldn't believe that someone who did Death of a Salesman, of course, <laughs> went, won because it always does. And we did this thing no one's ever heard of and how could we yes, it's yes, always like that we, it's always like that see i was really appreciative because my theater teacher and director at the time in high school um uh, hey larry uh he uh didn't believe in any of that he so he never submitted our shows for that so it was always like fun like it took away like a competitive I'm honestly, I've never actually thought about what if we had that competitive element of our theater program. Yeah. Oh, God. I would have showgirled someone if I'm being real. <laughs> oh, my God. That would have brought out an ugly side. Because I'm, like, secretly competitive. Mm-hmm. I'll okay. never show. I'm very pageant. I'm very pageant. I, I, will, ne- I will smile. I'll be ha- I will be ha- I will be ha- genuinely happy. But, I'm, but, like, deep down. Deep down, Deep it matters, down. no matter how much you pretend it doesn't. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's so funny, though, like uh, so many people that I talked to that ended up loving something. I mean, anything underbelly, be, be it like vintage stuff or burlesque mm-hmm. or punk rock or whatever the case may be, was usually the only one in their high school. That was like, yeah, or like well, maybe there was some other kid that they would see across, you know, campus, but like they never knew them and they were in a different grade or whatever. And you were always like, ooh, you seem kind of cool. Yeah. But maybe in the future, you know, yes. so many of us were like alone in that way. Yeah. And oh. it was really particularly cool when you found your people later on. Oh, no, totally. Like I had some friends who liked film. But, like, my world was old Hollywood. So, yeah. and them, you know, you know, high school film kids, you know, it's it's a little, it's it's a little bit of, like, the, like, AFI top 100 lists, like, a little bit. But most of it's going to be, like, a Tarantino fetish, you know, for a few years, you know. Yeah. Um, or, like, some really unwatchable, um, but lovable really bad stuff from the seventies. That's like, yeah, like toes, the line of pornographic, you know, like oh, that splo- was like exploitations. Yeah. 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 Like anywhere in that or like almost in a horror genre, but not quite. That was like, yeah. The cool film kids were in. Oh, the, like, like the ultimate cool kids are Gento. Like the ultimate cool <laughs> film kids. Yeah. yeah. They knew Argento in high school. And mm-hmm. I'd be like, I don't know him, <laughs> but I, I'm watching Audrey Hepburn. Like, <laughs> You know, I'm watching Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I agree with you. I, um, cause yeah, I really was the only one that was like obsessed with movies and especially um, like, like the iconic vintage cinema and mm-hmm. the way that I was. And I went to like, my school was so small. My class at the time was the biggest graduating class and there was like 80 something. Oh, wow. Like small, okay. small, small, small. So the chances of me finding anyone our age that was going to like anything on any level of mine was going to be slim to none. So I had to adjust. Um, but I did have, so my theater teacher, the one I mentioned, he is an old movie supreme buff. And he and I, he like, like that part, he when I would actually talk about movies and he would recommend movies to me. And it was like, it was nice to have someone who like talked about, like I could talk about movies with, and he uh, recommended a ton of movies that are my favorites to this day. Um, and he still is like, I still bounce like movies off of him. Oh, that's cool that you yeah. still know him and that y'all mm-hmm. still keep in touch. I wish I had kept in touch with my 
high school theater teacher who I accidentally called dad one time because I admired him so much. (laughs) He was so cool and so like giving, you know, like he just really wanted everybody to succeed and Mm -hmm. was always like handing me a monologue that he thought, you know, maybe I would do well with or would need later on or whatever. That's what my uh, Larry, that's what he would do. Um, we had another teacher in the theater department that we called dad, but it, just to piss him off. Cause he, <laughs> hey, like our school took us on a class trip to New York and all the theater kids were like, dad. And he would just turn like to us in the middle of the street being like, people really think I'm your dad. Can you oh no. Stop. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So then I have to back up because I just got really super curious. I know that Marilyn was like, what you wanted to be when you grew up but how did you get introduced to all the you know all this technicolor life that you love so much like what was it like i i i like to say i am eternally precocious um and um when i find something i am truly obsessed with i stay with that and i try Mm -hmm. to find out as much about said thing because I want to know. I want to be a bit of a savant. Um, mm-hmm. And um, dare I say. Um, oh, oh, you dare. <laughs> dare. Dare I say. Um, so for me, and I once again, it goes back. Marilyn to me is like a religious figure because it's like, I'm not only grateful for like her, like opening my like third world, my third eye, whatever. Third mm-hmm. eye. Thir- yeah, third eye. Um, I wouldn't, like I, um, she introduced me to Betty Davis. Like once I got to all about, all about Eve and I saw Betty Davis, I'm like, uh, Oh yeah. my God. Like it got like, Oh my, the, uh, the reaction I first had when I saw Betty Davis and all, and when it's all about Eve, when if Betty Day, if you're out there and your first interaction with Betty Davis is all about Eve, you understand what I'm talking about. It, it's truly like being um, like, it feels like someone just pushed you out of an airplane and you're riding through ho- and you don't know if you're going to make it out alive, but it's the adrenaline rush you get. It is mesmerizing. Watching Clouds her. are rushing by. Yes. You're pretty sure angels are swooshing around somewhere yes. and like rays of sun are d- meanwhile, happening, but like too intensely. And Meanwhile, yeah. you just hear fast in your seatbelts. Like, <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, like, yeah, it just like, it snowballed and I, I became very, um, like actresses have always been my, like how I've discovered new movie after new movie. So I would go through a Marilyn phase, then I go through a Betty phase, then I go through Elizabeth Taylor phase and a Joan Crawford phase and a Judy Garland and it just like eventually, and then it just started becoming, you know, more and more and more. Yeah. 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 Um, so... I want to ask you then um, if you can talk about your podcast a little bit because you have sure. such a vast knowledge and I want people to hear it because it's really cool. Uh-oh, if y'all hear that, that's my dog Aww. crying, stretching. Are you okay, bud? Maybe this is Aww, when I'll take a, like, a break for an ad. Yeah. He's rolling around. Are you okay? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I I I am fine. You I understand it. completely. When I record with my parents and my two dogs who are also dachshunds, <laughs> like yeah, I get. They just make so many sounds. Yeah, they You're not sure which ones are what. Do you need you need something? <laughs> Okay, can you hold that thought? We'll do, yeah, I'll, do, I'll put like an ad break in right here and then we'll pick it right back up. Let me go. Let me go yeah, make sure. Sounds good. Did you hear that sound? Yes. Me? Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll be right back. I'm sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> back from our ad break. Tell me about your podcast. How did you come up with this idea? So, my podcast, The Vintage Millennial, available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Um, I came up with it kind of as my revenge on not of my friends not wanting to watch old movies with me. <laughs> that's honestly where <laughs> that's honestly what it honestly what at its core what it is. It's I um myself and a different guest every week um or what well, biweekly um the podcast is biweekly. Um, a different guest comes on and we watch a film made 1980 or earlier. Um, the reason why 1980 is the cutoff, because since I call the show The Vintage Millennial, 
I am a millennial. Um, and millennials starred, the millennial age star in 1981. So I figure, okay, let's do everything that comes before. Okay, okay. Um, which unfortunately means we will never probably do a mommy dearest. But you know, we but you know what, we have to live with the choices we make. <laughs> like that film, everyone in it has to live with that that they made that <laughs> so film. very apropos. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Topical. <laughs> Here. I just I'm just trying to bring, you know, trying to bring I don't know. I don't know. You're bringing the um, I, bringing you know, it all full circle. Yeah, I literally had a flailing moment. I just couldn't control <laughs> my flails, and I tried to ca- think of something witty to say to catch it. But no, 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 no. Um, I don't know. I don't mind a, a, a decent like flail about now and then. Oh yeah. <laughs> You know, it's, uh, it provides good hand yeah. gestures. And... Oh, my God. I'm queer and Jewish. You bet your life I have um, hand gestures day well, in. I'm Italian-ish yeah, or you know. something and Texan. <laughs> and, yes. <laughs> Bosnian-Herzegovian. Like, hands hands are part <laughs> of this. Hands are part of it. I know sitting, sitting in the podcast is funny because for the video version, I really – like try to keep my hands in my lap just a little bit instead of like fidgeting and because mostly I'm scared I'm gonna um knock my mic over for sure um um but yeah so your podcast yes uh, um so that's the timeline together yes that's the timeline and then we get on the mic we uh break down the uh well, we introduce the guests and get their background on old movies, what's their connection, whether they're old movie buffs, cinephiles like myself, or they their grandparents showed them and they catch an old movie every now and then, but it's not like their um, universe. Or people who are just generally like, I've never cared, it's never been my thing. Either way, try to find a movie to talk about with that I know I could have a conversation with said person and... Um, we talk about the facts and figures of the movie and then we like break down the movie. And at the end of the day, we talk about um, why or why not we would recommend the movie to a modern audience. And I guess like the mission statement of the podcast is I think that films are the most vital, you know, it shows us where we are now, who we are then and what we could be in the future. Mm -hmm. And we can actually see this and hear it and how it makes our minds work in a way that in my personal opinion, I don't think any other medium does. And Mm -hmm. I think that a lot, you know, film preservation, film acknowledgement, um, we, it's not taught and it's not, um, I think seen as something important. And for me, that's kind of what I want my podcast to be. I want, People to even if like you're you come on and you never watch an old movie again, at least you watch that and maybe you'll come back to it. Maybe if mm-hmm. you're having a conversation with someone, they mention an old movie, you can say, Oh, I saw this, and maybe they never saw that movie, and maybe they'll go out and watch it, and then they'll actually like for me, it's just like I just want to keep classic cinema alive, and mm-hmm. I consider myself um, the I like to call myself the bimbo armchair uh, movie critic so <laughs> it that's just kind of how it came about uh you know or what it is one of the things you were you were saying that like it's it's the medium that's able to do that the most and i think one of the things that i love so much about classic movies other than the aesthetics i mean duh Obvious, but yeah. okay <laughs> aside from that <laughs> um especially when we're looking at 40s um is that it's really the acting style isn't really going to be able to happen again without it being referential that heightened that that version of passion that version of eyebrows mattering Mm, (laughs) like that version you know mattering part (laughs) that particular style of acting if you do it now you're like oh okay they're referencing a film noir or they're referencing right you know they're referencing sunset boulevard or they're you know what i mean like it's it's always um 
what's the word I'm looking for? But it's it, it's it'll never be that way again. So it's cool yeah. watching those movies because you're like, this is a time capsule of an acting style that was completely pure within itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's you know everything up until I would say sixty, like mid, like mid nineteen sixties. Uh, everything was so escapist when it came to movies and movie acting in particular. And that's why that everything earlier from like mid 60s onward is so dreamy to me and so such an escape because it's escapist. It's Mm -hmm. for your escape and your pleasure. And I love that style of acting. It is so over, it, it can be histrionic and over the top, but there is a real art to that style of acting because mm-hmm. you have to draw out emotion from not only yourself, but from your audience, you know, and it takes a special type of person who could do that. And I'm not saying that there isn't wonders to what acting is today, which is really was started in the new, quote unquote, the new Hollywood of the late 60s. Like, I love that style of acting too, but they're, you know, it, the fantasy of it's a little gone, you know? Mm-hmm. The dream world is a little gone, you know? Everything's real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I feel like a lot of the movies that I watch now, everything is, I mean, anything modern, almost everything is so, is so real. And even when yeah. they're trying to help you escape, it's still like just a little too like uh, opening the cereal box and like pouring a cup of coffee real if that yes. makes sense as opposed to like <laughs> sweeping down a staircase in a thing and and right. those characters feel real because the actors cared about their roles that they were playing but like yeah. you got to just kind of fall into that world for a little while and not have to be whoever you are today where as like i feel like movies i watch now anything that i've been through that's been tough in my life which there have been a lot of them right. um i'm like oh man this is where this story's gonna go i don't feel like doing this yeah. today like there can be in all honesty and an old film there can be a widow in the film which i've been widowed there can be a widow in the in a film in the 40s and i'm like oh my god i love her yes absolutely mm-hmm. get it goddess you know like <laughs> it like almost gl- it helps you glamorize widowhood which doesn't make any yeah. sense as a sentence but now no. if i watch a movie <laughs> about a widow <laughs> yeah. i'm like oh god i so don't feel like doing this today like well, i have I'm... to do this for the rest of my life are yeah. you kidding <laughs> like i want to go like where are the robes <laughs> no i completely get what you mean by like it's being when you are in one of the most vulnerable hardest places of your life and you see something that it's not what you're going they're not giving you what you're going through but they're technically being like what you said like a, a widow i don't i i've never seen a widow look like sophia loren in the black orchid but well (laughs) (laughs) but typically yes but typically yes but like (laughs) yeah I can imagine I mean I can't think of anything I'm sure there's something like that on my end that's personal that I can think of but I mean just because on that topic I can imagine there there's a surge of power that like okay I can put on an eyeliner I can put like there's something like if I don't know there's something that could be really helpful to just see Mm -hmm. that I feel like Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Absolutely. Well, so then since we're in this motivational (laughs) realm, I wanted to ask you, because you said that like you um, had that goal of posting every day and, um, you know, you have this ability to just glamorize yourself kind of perpetually in this really, really inspiring way. Like what motivates you? What is it that you like? What on your like just like uh uh-uh days what makes you go okay no no i really am gonna go ahead and do this um i'm trying that's a good question i'm trying to think um i mean i think just because like kind of what i said earlier it makes me feel alive it makes me feel Mm. um like there's something to 
God, that's really that's really dark. It's <laughs> it's okay. not as dark. Okay, I'm going to. It, this is very dark. This is going to sound very dark, but it's not as. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Life is good, yeah. but it's it makes things not as dark. If that makes sure. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Like, absolutely. Like life is. Life has meaning when I put on a red lip. <laughs> Yeah, and, well, life like, is that, rich. Yeah, right? it gives life me. Is so rich yeah, I'm like, that. yeah, it's like, well, I look. If I run into a neighbor, ever, I've moved to. It's been almost four months now since I've been here, and I will tell you, I have not left the house once without like a face, an outfit. Even if I'm mm-hmm. going on like a walk in between my lunch break and I'm not going out again, I I just do it because it's like it just feels good for myself. It just feels really, really good. And with Instagram, you know, I work from home and I finish the bulk of my work by the morning. So afternoon, I'm just sitting bored. And to be able to just kind of like set up, put on that outfit, set up my ring light, pose, take the photo, find the back or get the background that I wanted and start editing, which all that takes like probably two hours to do. It's wow. like, it's calming. Like, that's why I say like, it's like my knitting and I do. And that's why I do it every day. Like I, it's very rare from me. You don't get a post at least once a day. Wow. It's always once a day. It's never more than that. But like, it's very rare that you get, you don't get a post a day from me. That is so amazing that like, I admire that so much. Cause I all like, get super motivated and be like, I'm going to do X, Y, Z a day. I'm going to sing every day or, you know, like at this point I probably do sing every day humming or whatnot, but the dedication of posting something every single day or doing anything like, I feel like as soon as my mind zeroes in on it and I say, I'm going to do it every day is like the day that it's bound to not happen every single day. Yeah. (laughs) 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 And so, you know, I, I I wanted to ask like what what motivates you the most like in terms of your confidence like I know so now I know like you have the everyday thing but is there something that makes you feel confident even when you don't Um I I'm trying to think I don't know. It's a tough it, question, tough right? Confidence because, is a weird word. Well, it is because I, tr- to be honest, I really do believe that confidence really is just something you you have or you don't have. Like, mm-hmm. I really believe that. Like, it's just something, like, you have or you don't have. And I think that for some people, they've had people that help them really build their confidence up and... Um, have you had that? Have you had like mentors or people that like helped you helped you build or are you just like self built? Not when I needed it. Mm. Now I do. Now I have that kind of support. Um, mainly through that this vintage Instagram community that we oh, online I love community. That. Yeah. No, I didn't really get that. You know, I'm 28 and you know, when I grew up there wasn't body positivity. There wasn't um there wasn't that talk. There wasn't the talk of how do you talk in front of children about body? You know, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I had a very negative body image because everyone around me told me that my body was, you know, not, was unhealthy or was not, you know, wasn't, you know, what I always felt I could be. And I remember being 15, which is the age when everything really should feel the worst. Um, but I looked in the mirror and I was like, I don't know what everyone's talking about. I'm kind of hot. And Oh, I love that. Yeah. And it's like always been, you know, a thing for a long time, though, because, you know, again, weight is a very, you know, we can say that, you know, people can say, you know, they see the difference between beauty and weight. But most of the time you don't. A lot of people still not as much, but like growing up, they really held on to that. So, I, you know, I always would try to look my best, but no one would ever told me I look good. So I always kind of walk around. And I think part of it's the confidence comes comes from like, I'm going to show you type mm-hmm. of place mm-hmm. because no one I would, in my mind, always looked my best. Sure. And no one told me I was beautiful. No one told me I looked good or paid me a compliment. And then the last few years, 
it's very lovely and nice and it comes it makes me feel very humbled because I do get like a lot of compliments now and I do get people telling me that that's something I didn't have and now I'm just kind of like I think that that's built my confidence and I think in a healthy way I'd like to think because I'm able to walk around and be like yeah I am beautiful I am great and it's not based on Instagram likes it's based on you know a, it can be based on something that someone told me a couple months ago or it could be based on like I don't know just posting I don't just posting for some reason makes me feel pretty I could not get as much like likes or comments or whatever but for me I'm like I think I look cool I don't know I think that it's yeah yeah it's the act of doing I was listening to something recently that was talking about yeah. like how um part of the reason why we're not able to stay satisfied based on like likes and, and any kind of engagement, even comments at this point mm -hmm. is because our caveman brain really happiness is sort of supposed to be fleeting in some way. It's a oh, survival completely. thing. Yeah. Like if we could just like do one thing and then just become joyful over the moon, totally satisfied for the rest of our lives, then we wouldn't constantly, be searching for like the next set of berries or you know whatever caveman thing we were supposed to do so <laughs> set yeah, of berries very... okay i would make a really <laughs> bad caveman i'm like i'm searching oh. for the berries in the ceramic <laughs> <laughs> the minute i realized that there is no nail salon i would just i would just throw myself off the bridge <laughs> oh man yeah like they didn't even have chapstick like i can't I like I can't do without my stay on lipstick no. because my lips get chapped if I don't have like a stay on every okay. single day. Yeah. So like what? Okay, they just didn't need it. That's the answer. Yeah. Or maybe I they did. They... What did the chapped lip ones do? Like I feel for them. <laughs> I feel bad for every every cave person of the time because. <laughs> Oh my god! I want that on a T-shirt. I feel bad for every gay person. <laughs> I don't wear T-shirts, but if I did, I'd want it on one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's supposed to be fleeting in order to help us survive. Yeah. But they were well, saying that like there are more meaningful things that don't come from outside sources that can actually provide you for like a little bit more sustainable joy a little bit more like lasting yeah. and they were saying that like your instagram posts like that's where the joy comes from like you did the thing you created it yeah you i accomplished you put it out into the world you accomplished something and anything that comes afterwards is like no big deal anything that comes afterwards yeah. is like oh, okay you know and it's not the and i will not lie i will not act like i do not get pressed sometimes over likes I will not act, I will not be that Instagrammer that doesn't say that every now and then I have to have a talk with myself and say and ask why is this really that important. And I think part of it is because I will say some of those edits are not are they take a lot of time and practice and a lot of energy. And when something like you work really really you know this when it, I'm sure you've had this moment we've all had these moments where you work really hard on something and you put it on the world thinking it's going to be like you if it's not going to blow you up it's going to glow you up for like a day or two and <laughs> no one likes it and you're like what's the problem what's good miley <laughs> that's the ad you get it's that attitude but it yeah. but also at a certain point like after like a few hours an hour or two i'm always like you know what it's not, move on, <laughs> move on with your day. It's not the end of the world. Get away from your phone, keep yeah. away from it for the rest of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Go look I, at like some birds or some trees for yeah. a second or like go, go, go do something else for a while. What? Watch the view. <laughs> no, do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. It's that, it's that, it's, I don't know if I'm the only one, but like, I have a show, like, if there's one show that I literally grew up on and I don't really like watching it anymore, but like, I've been watching for so long, I just, I still do. It's The View. It's The View. That's it's Martha the view. Stewart for me. 
I hear you. Martha Stewart, any year, like we're talking like beginning, like her like house with some with some strange like um, wooden beams at the top and a bunch of copper pans hanging from it, like all the way to her modern Instagram, like IGTV stuff. It's what I turn on when I'm like, the world is dumb. Yes. And I don't want to think about anything and I just want to hang out. I, Martha Stewart's the one. Yeah. I can, you know, I can I just that. watch her put oil on a chicken like she's demonstrated how to put oil and lemon on a chicken for years now there are so many iterations and each one she's seems figured it like out every time just as interesting <laughs> <laughs> or as calming i don't know if interesting is the right word but calming yeah oh no i get that completely um so this may seem like a really silly question after everything that we've talked about so maybe i'm gonna make it more specific i usually ask people what inspires you but like okay that's that's we know we know what inspires you that's so beautifully fabulously clear so i'm gonna get mm. challenging and and specific okay what like maybe top three movies have inspired you the most what are the ones oh my god um oh god okay <laughs> okay Sorry, i'm gonna say evil. no 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 i'm you're gonna expose me for being super basic for like this is very very basic but oh my god i love it no but it, it i never ugh, i've suppressed it for so long until you ask i would say maybe honestly the biggest one for me influence connecting where i was in middle school to where i am right at this very very moment honestly watching holly go lightly and breakfast at tiffany's was yeah a big deal for me it was seeing someone in that vintage world living this um unrealistic but just stunning new york life and like she didn't mm -hmm. have a lot but she like you know it was it was a beer life on a champagne or champagne life on a beer budget excuse me and just kind of being free and kind of i mean holly's careless and horrible in my opinion um, and I am, um, a very independent person. I like, I like to think I like to put people's feelings before into perspective, unlike Holly, but like, you know, I mean, like I, it really, and you know, now here I am, I'm living in New York and I'm in like, I've made my little vintage house in this, this one bedroom apartment, which I got very lucky with, um into my little glam house and I get to walk around New York in my little fabulous outfits. And I feel <sighs> like that's part of, I guess that's kind of part of where the confidence comes from. It comes from this feeling of like, okay, my, if my young self could see me just walking down the street right now, not knowing that like, I don't really, I'm not really working the job I want. I'm not like in like the place in my life where I'm like, I'm fulfilled. But if they saw me based on how I look, they'd be very happy. And that makes me feel like sent it gives me a little sentimental like yeah. yeah 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 so i guess that one would be a big thing auntie mame is a very big one oh. um just how she, her philosophy that character's philosophy of you know life's a banquet and most sons of bitches are starving to death you know i oh. that's how it's like you know you gotta live life for yourself first selfishness isn't always the worst crime. And I think that we have made selfishness or just the word um, a thing that it shouldn't be. Um, I think that it's very important to take time for yourself. And I think there's something about Auntie Mame just being herself and not caring. It's like, she's a, like it comes off in the 1950s world as like selfish, but like, what's the problem? You know? Yeah. I mean, I think... <sighs> Sometimes in my life, whenever I'm feeling like um, lonesome in a challenge, mm -hmm. uh, I have a little thing that I say to myself, which is like, own two feet, good night, own two feet. And it's not meant to like leave anybody behind yeah. me or leave anyone out necessarily or like not be grateful for because, you know, I have a lot of support and a lot of love yeah. and all of that. But there's also something to be said for being like, you know. Actually, I'm going to take care of myself on this one. Yeah. And I'm going to do what I need to do without harm to mm -hmm. make sure that I'm good to go. 
and to yeah. take care of myself. And I think that can be like maybe perceived as selfish now and then or perceived in whatever way. But honestly, that's not that's like the, yeah. on them. <laughs> you exactly. know? Like I can't, I can't I, control perception, but I can definitely yeah. control like that to me is more self care than like a bubble bath is ever yes, going to. Exactly. And I feel like Auntie Mame, like she never conformed and not conforming is in a weird way considered to be it's not called selfishness, but in a way people act like it's selfishness to not conform. And, you know, I relate to that a lot. Um I'm trying to think. Okay, a third. So we got Holly Golightly. Um, call me basic. I dare you. It's fine. It's whatever. It's cool. Um, Auntie Mame. I redeem myself on that one. Um, and then, um, trying to think. It has to be a movie. No, it can be anything. Yeah. I mean, I asked movie, but like, I don't care. There are no rules. Well, (laughs) okay. Um, I was just about to say Elizabeth Taylor and who's for Virginia Woolf just to see what your reaction would be. Um, <laughs> that's my future. Um, well, oh. My future is Celia Cruz. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, mean, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but like my, at some point I'm going to put on a caftan. I'm going to put on huge earrings mm. and just like a turban maybe, or just wrap my hair up. And oh yeah. Cruise around through see oh my god, that was a terrible pun. I'm gonna Celia Cruise <laughs> my way around the grocery store. Um, on your motor scooter. I can't Oh my god. I L O L I'm so sorry for that pun. But yes, I'm here. I mean we all have we all have the ideal um future self. Yours is interesting. <laughs> But I get it. I oh, totally okay. Get it. The third one, I just looked right behind me. Barbara Streisand, funny girl, I think is. Well, because that character as a whole is someone I can really relate to. The person that grew up that didn't feel necessarily the most attractive person. Um, the person I also related to, like, and humor was always, like, I was always funny. That's always mm-hmm. been my, uh, my, armor that's always been what shined the most about me i've always been known for being funny and getting people to laugh like i can i it's very rare i can't get a little smile out of someone yeah just a little and that makes me very happy and but it's also like a coping mechanism too in the way that she that character uses her humor um and on top of it she's so jewish like she's just so Mm. ethnically jewish and that's something that I didn't really realize I was until I went to college and all my friends weren't Jewish, which was the first time for me. And I realized talking to them, I was like, my experiences are as a, as an American Jewish person are very different. And I ethnically am just, am very Jewish. Like I can't hide that. And I love that about that character. She does not attempt to hide that. And I feel like there's not I don't ever feel like I had to, but like I could, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I could have felt Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And a character like that, if I did feel like that and I saw a character like that, it might, you know, make me feel better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and a lot of times the things that society made us feel like we were supposed to hide and tuck away and not be or um yeah. appear or whatever the case may be are the things that make us a star or that make us inspiring to other people or the things that set us apart because like you said people you know conforming is like people's comfort zone yeah. um so it's you know we get told to tuck those things away whatever they may be but it turns out that's usually the thing that just makes you mm-hmm so incredible and so rad and so exciting to be around and usually the ones that tell you to tuck that away are insecure about something or scared of something or totally boring yeah bo- <laughs> i call don't know just, just i don't want to call people boring that's oh, not a nice will. thing to say oh i will but- <laughs> call them but- out bore Boring. <laughs> bored. Oh my god. <laughs> that clip of Lindsay Lohan as Elizabeth Taylor. I'm so bored. 
Well, so actually, uh, I just want to ask you 10,000 questions. I promise I won't make you talk for um, (laughs) the rest of your life, even though I want to. Um, But Elizabeth Taylor made me think of the fact that that is still one of my favorite biographies I've ever read was about Elizabeth Taylor. Do you is like do you have any books that you recommend as reading your jam? If not, that's totally cool, but I just um, always love a good I, list of books if possible. I books, 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 books. I um you know, it's funny. I love I love biographies. Um this has nothing to do with anything we've talked about today this person, but uh my favorite book I read this year was Mariah Carey's uh, memoir. <gasps> what i have to read that oh don't okay if you like audio listen to it on audio because there's parts of the book that she actually sings yeah it's inc- it's one of the best audios i've ever read uh, yeah well i guess read it's inc- it's her life is wild um i'm trying to think old hollywood wise um I just started reading um, a book about the Mankiewicz brothers that I am interested to keep reading. I just downloaded Elvira's memoir that I'm very, I'm honestly putting the Mankiewicz brothers one aside because I'm like, this is Elvira. This is important. And she just came out. So like, this is really important. I, God bless her. Yeah. Yeah. She really is someone who I think a lot of us, look up to you know what I mean Mm -hmm. she created a character that is hers and uses it for the world and she's been going forever like not to like age her but it gives everyone else hope you know yeah she has a very specific style and stamp like a stamp like you look like I can look at like an outfit and be like oh that's like you or like this is something like it's easy to figure out you know yeah, yeah, it's I've always been amazed at the fact that she was able to take like um the other incredible icons like, you know, Vampira and and Morticia and I guess all of their names in the A, don't oh, they? Yeah. Yeah, well, oh, except for Lily, oh, Lily Monster. Monster. Okay. Yeah, okay, there we go. And those were so clearly them as well, except that she took all of them and then like rolled it up into this even sexier package. And Mm -hmm. even funnier and even smarter and even like, yeah, like spookier in a completely just more intense cartoonish spooky way than they had already done. And now she just gets to totally own that. Well, and that, (sighs) and she, for me, when I talk about like comedy idol, she is very high up there because I, you know, my stand up was all based around me getting up being very dolled, very vintage. And then getting up and just being myself, which is innately very, like, I have, my interests aren't really of our time, but the way I speak, the way I present myself, the way I talk, like, that, it it is very, like, of a person my age living in my day and time. Mm -hmm. And I always felt connected to Elvira and that for that, because her look is so goth and sleek and, like, dangerous. But when she opens her mouth, she's a valley girl who's, like, scared of spiders. (laughs) <laughs> like it's the yeah. unexpected like that's the comedy like it's like this beautiful package presentation that opens its mouth and you're like oh this isn't huh <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I love might her. need some I might need some talking lessons because even though I don't perpetually speak like I came out of the 40s or 50s or whatever everyone's small the word rad will pop out of oh yeah mouth. I say groovy but rad is not of the times no. like I have some catching up to do because oh, I, I say, feel like that's like the most <laughs> I say I'll text people groovy and they'll be like what and I'm like groovy and they're like how old are you and I'm, and I'm just like I'm just living <laughs> it just <laughs> just thriving man yeah we just be, dude how dare yeah. how i was so happy actually when you texted me groovy today i was so happy because yeah. you know like my parents are showbiz folks as well but, oh no way um they're in this like they they're they're roots are in this kind of 70s austin cosmic country world and Love so that. when i placed what my dad's time. stuff yeah. at the country music hall of fame and i went through all their letters to each other which are hilarious by the way like sense of humor 
oh my god a bunch of texans that moved to austin to like get high and make music it's some of the funniest stuff i've ever read but yeah like you know they would say groovy and you know yeah. all that lingo was was for real so when you said groovy today i was like oh yay, one girl. of my favorite <laughs> one of my favorite books is um Call, is love Janice. It's a Janice Joplin's sister's book about Janice Joplin. Mm. And it's filled with all the letters that she wrote to home and all her personal, because that was something I learned about. One thing that's really interesting about Janice Joplin is that she constantly wrote to people and people at that time, it was so wild because mm-hmm. that was considered to be so of the parents time to write. Yeah. And she yeah. wrote like her family, she wrote fr- like she also all these letters and just the way that she would speak and the the language, the amount of man like at the end <laughs> of like it's so I love that time and she she came from that era. Well, yeah, a little earlier than that, but yeah. Yeah, there's this letter I found where Ray Benson, who's from Asleep at the Wheel, wrote my dad when my dad uh, got cancer for the first time. And he writes this letter and it's totally heartfelt. But he might as well have said, I don't remember how he puts it, but he might as well have said, like, this totally sucks, dude. (laughs) You know, because they're in their late 20s. Yeah. And, you know, it's a heavy, heavy thing, but they've never really encountered that before. Yeah. So it's like this totally sucks, man. What a what a drag, you know, and (laughs) it's like I just I love those 70s letters like that. So, so, so much. Um, It's far out. It's far out. Well, like I said, I could I could do this for like a million years, but um, I won't do that to you. But you'll just have to come back on if you want to. I, I would you'll... love to. Thank you for having me. Please, I need to have you on mine now. I would love to. Yeah. The disco balls on my to. on my dance floor now. Ooh, please. Well, I have one more question before we go. Is that okay? Do you of have time course. for us? Yes. Okay, because this is one of the questions <laughs> I am asking everyone. Um. Which is, what would you say to people who are aspiring to be something? Like, especially because so many people are changing, they're pivoting their careers right now. And you have been a big inspiration to me, just flat out. And I know that you inspire a lot of people with the cool stuff that you're up to. So what would you say to somebody who's aspiring to be something or accomplish something each day or whatever the case may be? Go with the flow, your time will come. That is Mm. my mantra. Go with the flow, your time will come. I have a very set in my head that I'm going to rule the world. (laughs) But I believe it. But it won't be till so I'm 28 now, or as I like to say, 25 for the third time. I um will be my plan is oh god. Well now it's recorded, so here it goes. This is my plan. But this is how I will. This is how I present. I'm 25 till I'm 30. I'm 35 till I'm 40. I'm four, and then once I'm 40, it just we don't speak about it. What about if that's um, just because what happens at 40 is like so incredible that well, you can't even put I, it into words? Well, yet. so I that's kind of part of the reason because I've always said I'm going to hit big in bet- between 35 and 40. It's okay. not now. I've always because when I was younger, I like I said, I was always compared to like Harvey Firestein, and I was always given the father roles in high school, and I was always told to play the older person, and it just, it just, I realize it's like okay, that I take that as a universal sign that my time is not going to be when I'm young or when I'm like showbiz young, shall I say, but it's going to be when I'm more settled with myself, and I think that's going to be even better. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so, but like, I'm so anxious for that day to come um, that I have to always say to myself, like, go with the flow, your day will come. Mm-hmm. I truly believe my day will come. If you out there tr- are a dreamer like I am, like you are, and truly believe that you're going to own the world one day, your time, but you're anxious about it, just let go. There's nothing you can do about it right now. Just keep doing your thing. Your time will come. Just keep working at it and keep exploring. You know, there's so many things, you know, I was so sad about stand up being my ultimate end all, end all be all. But then I, you know, over quarantine, I really, you know, I don't know if that is really it. And, you know, that's fine. That's fine. I can come back to it. 
I'm working on so many other things right now that, you know, I'm exploring and I'm seeing them. We're all young and, you know, trying to figure it all out. So yeah, chill, <laughs> chill, <laughs> chill, chill. Aww. That's really the advice. Just chill. I love it. Well, again, thanks so much for hanging out with me and Thank let everybody so know much. how can they find you? How can everyone find you? So you can find me on Instagram. I am at um, them underscore fatal on there. And then I am on TikTok and Twitter at uh, them un- at them fatal 93. And if you are would like to listen to my podcast, the Vintage Millennial Podcast, the old movie podcast for a modern audience, you can check that out on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and follow us on Instagram at the Vintage Millennial Podcast with a bunch of underscores in there. Ooh. Ooh. I'm so Take used deep breath. <laughs> Honestly, at this point, I'm so used to doing it. It just I'm like it's robot it's robotic. I'm like Okay, let me count three. One, two. And you can follow me here, here. It just is like. <laughs> you got it down. Yeah. Well, thanks again. Thank you and... for having me. This has been so much fun. Oh, you're welcome. And let me know when you want me to come on all. Uh, on yes, we, we got numbers we now. Out. We will text. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I have to think of it. Okay. Send me a list of movies that like you haven't seen yet, but you want to that just fit in with that time period. Doesn't oh have gosh. to be anything. And I'll pick and I'll surprise you with it. Oh my gosh. Like the day okay. of, I'll be like, we're watching this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, I have an assignment. <laughs> <laughs> after that, you don't get, after that, you get to lay back and just watch the movie. I'm the one, I'm the one who has to type. <laughs> oh, well, knowing my analytical brain, I'm going to have like notes and just, I'm going to get oh, real Every vintage it, so. old movie person that has come on to the podcast or just movie person in general comes with the notes. Mm-hmm. I'm very, mm-hmm. I'm re- I'm ready for it all the time. Yeah. I'm like, let's hear them. Let's go. Fabulous. Okay. Well, thank you. And talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. That's it for this episode of Made of Stardust. Thank you so much for tuning in. This podcast is supported by listeners like you. If you want to get exclusive access to behind the scenes content and all the fun goodies, go to joliegoodnight.com slash podcast. Every contribution helps to keep this podcast shooting for the stars. Thanks for your support, and we hope we've inspired you today. 